The following is an HEB Satellite in the Classroom presentation, brought to you by the HEB Grocery Company, serving more Texans better every day. Additional funding is provided by Nestle. Get ready for a ride through the world of natural science. Welcome to Science Quest. We're coming to you live today from the Houston Museum of Natural Science in Houston, Texas, where you'll find dozens of exciting hands-on exhibits. Everything from dinosaur bones to space science to computer games. Each year, more than two million people come from across the country and around the world to visit the Houston Museum of Natural Science. But today, HEB Satellite in the Classroom brings the museum to you. Good morning, I'm Kate Brown, host for HEB Satellite in the Classroom, and I want to welcome you to another exciting edition of Science Quest. We're coming to you live today from the Strake Hall of Malacology because we're going to be talking about one of the largest and most interesting groups of animals on the planet, the mollusks. Now this group includes everything from snails and she seashells, like the state seashell of Texas, the lightning whelk, to bivalves like this giant clam, and even octopus and squid, and today you're going to learn a little something about each of them. Now don't forget to give us a call at the end of the program with any questions that you have using that special toll-free line, 1-800-552-7126. And speaking of questions, right now it's time to join Elisa Lewis, the education coordinator here at the museum, who's talking with a group of students who have some questions of their own. Hello, Kate. I'm on the other side of the Malacology Hall with some students of mine who are curious about mollusks. Before we start, can anyone tell me what a mollusk is? I know. Okay. A mollusk is a soft-bodied animal with no backbone. That's right, kind of like clams, squids, and snails. This is a huge group of animals. There are over 100,000 different species of mollusk. Now, this group is further subdivided into eight subgroups or classes. And I bet you guys know the top three. Who can name you one? I can. Bivalves or clams. That's right, or mussels, oysters, things like that. Who's got another one? How about this one, gastropods and snails? That's right, snails or slugs or nudibranchs. Super, anyone have the last one? Cephalopods like squids and octopuses. Right, squids, octopuses, nautilus, things like that. And what do we have so far? We've got bivalves, we've got gastropods, and cephalopods. Let's start taking a closer look at these things. Start with a bivalve. Do you know why we call it a bivalve? Yes, because a bivalve has two valves. Right. This animal makes a shell with two valves hinged together there, right there in the middle. When an animal is shut, it is protected by the shell. Bivalves will open their shells to breathe and to feed. Now let's take a look at your gastropod. This species of gastropod can grow up to about two and a half feet long, making it the largest gastropod in the world. Do you know what gastropod means? Yes, it means stomach foot. Exactly. Take a look at this garden snail on my hand. Now, like all gastropods, you can see it has a really fine head here with the eyes and this muscular foot coming out of the bottom of the shell. That's why we call it a stomach-footed animal. All right? Also, like most gastropods, it has this spiral shell. All right? Now, let's take a closer look at my favorite, the cephalopods. Pull that out of there, take a look at it, and can you see why they call it a cephalopod or a head-footed animal? Yes, because the head is down by all the tentacles. That's right. Its head or its mouth is surrounded by all these tentacles or feet. Now, when we normally think of cephalopods, we think of animals that look a little bit like this. You can't see a shell on them. All right. Now, here is a cephalopod with a shell. This is called a chambered nautilus. This is an animal where the head and the tentacles would come out of the shell this way. All right. Now, take a look at your chambered nautilus. It's been split in half. Can you see why they call it a chambered nautilus? Yes, it has all these chambers in it. That's right, the nautilus animal builds those into the shell as he grows. Now, we have seen three of the eight major groups of mollusks. We've seen bivalves, gastropods, and cephalopods. Now let's join John and Kate to learn more. It's back to you, Kate. Thanks, Elisa. We're here now inside the Stray Call of Malacology with our guest for today's show, David Temple, who some of you may recognize from previous shows. David is one of the education instructors here at the museum. Welcome, David. Good morning, Kate. Thank you. Now, unfortunately, Dr. John Wise, the curator of Malacology, was unable to be with us today because he's ill, but we're very thankful to have David with us to talk about mollusks. 
David and I are standing amidst 2,500 different shells, which represent the museum's collection, extensive collection, of more than a million different species of mollusks. And you can see some footage of them there. They all look very different, but the one thing that they all have in common is that they were all created by the soft-bodied animals known as mollusks. Now, on a previous show at the Texas State Aquarium, we talked briefly about the difference between a conchologist and a malacologist. But David, would you review for me real quickly what the difference is? Certainly, Kate. A conchologist is an individual that their field of study, they're primarily interested in the shells themselves, mm -hmm. the shells that these soft-bodied animals create. A malacologist is more interested in the actual animals in the shells, but the actual animals and their life history and their life cycles and, and how they live their lives. And there are a lot of them. As Elisa mentioned, this is one of the largest groups or phylums of animals on the planet, over 100,000 different living species. That's correct. They are second only to insects, so they can, they can cheer, we're number two, we're number two. So insects are number one, they're number two. And we normally associate mollusks with living in the sea as marine animals, but I understand they can be found in virtually every habitat on Earth, and we have some footage of their different homes. That's correct. Of course, you're familiar with seeing them at the ocean, but there's different habitats at the ocean. This mollusk is an Indo-Pacific one that would be found in shallow water. It can also be found on land. In Antarctica, they can be found in some deserts. They're also found, though, in tropical forests, like this particular tree snail is. Uh, that you see there. Quite beautiful. Very much so. Also fresh water. You can find them in ponds, rivers, creeks, streams. Uh, they live there. And here we have a pond snail that's actually laying eggs. So those are eggs that she's laying there. And we can see that the mollusks all look extremely different. How different are they? Yeah, if you wanted to be a mollusk, there's a myriad of different shapes or forms you could take. Uh, you could be a bivalve. You could be a gastropod. Uh, you could be a tiny microscopic mollusk that might, that might get its food by basically predating on other animals and drinking their blood. Uh, they come in all sizes. There's some uh, mollusks, of course, that are very, very large. For instance, this clam right here, uh, that's about a 500-pound clam, and it's capable of producing about a 14-pound pearl. That's a big pearl. That's a really big pearl. A strand of those would be very heavy. This particular one is the one that we have on display here in the hall. So now that's we saw a giant that at clam. the open of the show. That's correct. You could also be some of the more odd uh, mollusks that are contained in that group are things like squid and octopus. This is a giant squid. It's not the giant squid, Archituthis, but it's very closely related. This guy's about six and a half feet long. An Archituthis would be ten times this big. And we can see from the subtitle there that this footage was obviously provided to us by um, some Japanese photographers, and I understand very rare footage. That's correct. Nobody ever gets close to these because these types of uh, cephalopods are the fastest mollusks. They're extremely fast, and it's very difficult to get near them. In fact, the only reason these divers are able to get near this animal and photograph it and, and examine it uh, as they are is because the animal is dying. They're quite elusive. Now, I understand one of their most interesting habits, or something that we do know about them, is that they actually fight with toothed whales in the ocean. How do researchers know that? Well, basically, when they fight, it's not so much that you'd think of a fight like a boxing match. <laughs> they are fighting for their lives, because it so happens that these toothed whales, not unlike a lot of people, like squid. They like calamari. So the whales will try to eat the squids, and we know uh, this because they actually find in the stomach contents of the whales, they find huge segments of tentacles and parts of their mantle, and they also find parts of the squid beaks, as well as sucker marks on their skin from where the, the squid has gripped them. So squid have beaks? Squid have beaks. It looks very similar to something that you might see uh, on a parrot's beak, and they use this for grasping their prey and tearing it, uh, tearing chunks off and eating it. Well, we can see how different the mollusks look. Yep. The squid, the snail, and even the octopus. And the octopus we frequently refer to as the Houdini of the sea, because you can see here, he's quite a master at camouflage. Oh, they're amazing, Kate. Octopus are one of my one of the most interesting animals. One of the things they can do, they can not only change color, but they can also change texture. So if you want to be on a rough, bumpy background that's brown, you simply become brown and rough and bumpy. And the three features that make a mollusk a mollusk, we can see here up on the screen. The first one would be? Uh, the first one would be you have to have a mantle. If you don't have a mantle, you're not a mollusk. And that's a fleshy <laughs> covering that basically goes around the animal and around the, the shell. And number two? The, number, the second one would be you have to have a shell gland. Most mollusks have shell glands. They use these glands for secreting the material that they make their shells out of. And finally, number three? And the last thing they have is they have a radula, which a radula <laughs> is basically mollusk teeth. So you're telling me that snails have teeth? Snails have teeth. That innocent-looking garden snail you see outside 
probably has something that's similar to this. Now those teeth look a little bit more ominous. They've been magnified 200 times. These are the teeth of a predator. A carnivorous a snail. A carnivorous snail. So th these radulas are very specialized. This one is used for basically tearing the skin of the other animals that this one is consuming. Perhaps another snail. <laughs> exactly. Most snails tend to go after snails. Um, this particular one, or some of these, have as many as 250,000 different teeth. Now this particular radula right here is an example of a grazer, of an herbivore. So this is the kind of radula that you might find actually in a Carmen garden snail that you might see outside in your yard, the things that people consider to be garden pests. And they use them for scraping algae and whatnot. Right, they'll use it for scraping algae and plant material. And what about like the bivalves, like the giant clam that I was standing in front of in the beginning? Do they have teeth? Uh, no, they don't have teeth because they don't have a head, <laughs> so there's no place to put them. Uh, what they have is uh, a siphon. So they have a siphon that they will they'll open the shell a little bit and they'll extend the siphon out and they'll use that to pull in water that has nutrients in it. And they also have a foot which they would use for burrowing themselves either in the sand or the mud wherever they're, they happen to be living. Okay, well thanks David. We'll be back in just a moment to talk some more about mollusks. But right now it's time to join Dr. Carolyn Sumners for this month's edition of Skylog. And you want to pay close attention because Carolyn is talking about a very interesting comet which you can see right now in the night sky. Hi Kate. The question for this month is, have you seen Hale Bopp? No, it's not a TV show. It's a comet named for Mr. Hale and Mr. Bopp, the astronomers who found it. It's a very special comet because it's so large, probably the largest we've seen in a century, and it's pretty bright in the Houston skies. It's a good time to go out and look for the comet. Tell you what, let's go to the computer, get us some star charts, and find out where it's going to be. Here we see the Earth, where we are tonight, of course, and above the plane of the solar system is the orbit of Comet Hale-Bopp. Notice the comet does come close to the orbit of the Earth, but not when we are close by. The comet will be 130 million miles from us at its closest, and that is no problem. Not nearly close enough to cause any damage. The comet 20 months ago looked like a dirty snowball. Dust, gas mixed up together, and then we began to watch it develop a tail. And it's the tail that can be millions of miles long and make the comet so spectacular. In February, we began to see that tail in the morning sky before sunrise. And as we watched throughout the month, the comet began to grow its tail and become brighter at the same time. The coma region is as bright as the brightest star. The tail is much fainter and always requires darker skies. By the end of February, there were definitely two tails, the gas tail, which is blue, and the dust tail forming beside it. A close-up shows the nucleus and coma of the comet and the two distinct tails, the soft dust tail and the gas streamers of the ion or gas tail. In March, the comet has gotten much more spectacular. We've now got a very distinct ion or gas tail and a lot of dust for the dust tail as well. Let's plan what it's like to go out and see the comet. For that, we need some star charts. In this star chart, we see the comet leaving the morning sky, getting so close to the sun in the morning that we can't see it there anymore. Now, by this weekend, the comet is pulling away from the sun in the northwestern evening sky. There you see it getting higher and higher, moving quite quickly, I would say, with a tail pointing away from the sun. The constellation Cassiopeia, which looks like an M or a W on its side, is a good reference frame. The comet is going to move behind it at the end of evening twilight. And then in April, we still have Comet hale bopp Comet hale bopp is one of the largest comets we've ever seen, and it's really spectacular, really in the sky and actually as it goes past the sun. In April, you can see the comet moving through Perseus. Well, Kate, it's a great weekend to go out and do some astronomy. When you're at the beach looking down at the shells, think about looking up at the same time. There's a lot happening in the sky. Thanks, Carolyn. We're back now with David Temple talking some more about mollusks, beginning with this large shell that you're holding. Tell me about this one. Oh, this is called a Boozycon perversum, Kate, and this is actually the Texas state shell. And it's unique, I understand, because it's the only one that opens on its left side. That's correct. Most shells, like people, are right-handed. This particular shell is left-handed. If you hold it up 
with its apex, which is this point right there, which is the oldest part of the shell. If you hold that up towards you, you'll notice that the opening is here on the left side. Which we can see if we look at this next shell is very different. This is a right-handed shell, correct? That's correct. As most mollusks are right-handed, this triton's trumpet does open on the right-hand side. And this is quite a beautiful shell, but I sure haven't seen it around these parts on Texas beaches. No, you see these typically in the Caribbean. Now I have seen, however, smaller versions of the one that you're holding, the lightning whelk, but they look a little bit more like this one. That's correct. This is the, these larger ones tend to be in deeper water, so it's very uncommon that you find them washed up on the beach. The smaller ones, however, will stay closer into shore and in much shallower water, and you do tend to find them washed up on the beaches more. How old is the larger one compared to this smaller one? This larger whelk right here is about 20 years old, and this guy right here is probably about three years old. So he's just a youngster. He's just a youngster, and this is, a, this is an old one. Now, I understand that we actually have some footage of the growth series of the whelk to show us how the shell gets from this stage to that one. We do. As you can see, they start off very, very tiny, and then they will grow by accretion. They're using that shell gland we discussed earlier. They'll add layer upon layer on their shelf as the animal gets larger inside, just makes himself a bigger home. He doesn't actually have to move, he just enlarges his home. And uh, Buzikon, of course, this particular shell is actually a carnivore, it likes to eat clams. Really? Yes. And if we take a look at the back side of the shell, you can actually see the striations. Yes, these particular striations that you can see right in through there, those are the, the accretion lines. So this is where he has added to his shell little by little as the animal inside has gotten larger. So you can see it pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. How do shells or mollusks like this one reproduce? Uh, pretty much the way most things reproduce, it starts with a fertilized egg. So the mother Buzikon will take about 50 to 100 such eggs and she'll spin a case around them and she'll lay the eggs in a case. And if you listen closely here, you can actually hear there's some of the small uh, uh, mollusks that are in there. Um, and then she'll take this strand and she'll attach it to some sort of substrate in the bottom of the water there, either some mud or a rock or a piece of coral, and, why does and she leave do it that? there. Well, she leaves it there because she doesn't want those to end up as these did. Basically, what happens when you have a storm or something that comes through, it will pull them off the seafloor and wash them up on the beach where they're exposed to sunlight and, then they and dry the drying effect, like these. and it kills them. That's correct. Now, if we were to take that and crack it open, we would find what we have in our little Petri dish here, which are the tiny, tiny beginnings of the whelk, right? That's correct. And so these little animals right here, you just add uh, some good food in about 20 years, and you'll end up with something like this vastly different from the larger shell oh, that absolutely. you're holding. And this particular one, that little tip right there that you're seeing there is the very tip of that particular shell of, of those mollusks right there. So this is the oldest part of the shell right there. And I understand that you actually have a favorite shell here within the hall. Tell me about that one. I do. Actually, I have a lot of favorite shells. <laughs> but one that I have here to talk to you about today is something called a carrier shell. If you're interested in collecting shells, this is where this animal actually likes to collect shells too, but he'll collect coral, he'll collect garbage, he collects glass. And they basically, by crawling along the bottom, these things are accrued to its shell. It adds them to its shell. So we have some footage of some other, we have quite a few uh, carrier shells, different types on display here within the hall, and I think we have some footage of those. That's correct. Why do. does the shell choose to pick up other shells and debris like you mentioned? Well, one thing that they, they, they surmise is that it's for camouflage. What better way to be camouflaged in with the background if you take the background with you? So they'll do that. And the other thing is they suspect it's somewhat like a snowshoe and that these animals tend to live on very soft uh, floor substrates and by spreading their wealth around and adding more things to their shell, it um, keeps them from sinking in the mud. And this one is actually a gastropod, right? That's correct. It's a, it's a gastropod. It has the single opening uh, that you can see right Let's there. Let's see where the foot would go. Well, thank you so much for your time today, David. David will be back with us at the end of the program in just a few moments to take your questions. It'll be t your turn to ask. That number, once again, is 1-800-552-7126. I also want to invite all of our viewers to come to the Houston Museum of Natural Science in the fall because the brand new Hall of Malacology will be opening at that time and you can come see all of the mollusks in person. Right now, however, it's time once again for Dr. Howie Do It. And as David mentioned earlier, there are three different specific characteristics that make a mollusk a mollusk. Well, today, Howie's having a tough time getting into club mollusk. I'm Dr. Howie Do It, and hey, man, I'm ready to party, baby. 
I'm going to one of the oldest and most elite clubs in town, Club Mollusk. Here we are. Let me in so I can party down. I'm sorry, sir, but you must have a mantle to come inside Club Mollusk. Show me your mantle or stay outside. No respect. No respect at all. What do you mean I got to have a mantle? I got a mantle right here. Mickey Mantle, the mixture, a baseball legend. Now let me in the club. No, sir. That's not the kind of mantle you need for Club Mollusk. You'll have to do better than that. You see what I mean? No respect at all. What do you mean that's not the right kind of mantle? Well, what about this one? It's even got a fire in it. Now, let me in the club. I cannot allow you inside Club Mollusk, sir. Oh, that kind of mantle. You must mean a fleshy pocket or cavity that surrounds my entire body. I'll be right back. Check it out. Pretty freaky, baby. A big fleshy pocket that surrounds my entire body. Now this is the kind of mantle that's gonna get me into Club Mollusk. Okay, you've got the mantle, but you're not getting in Club Mollusk unless you show me a shell gland. A swelled hand? Well, great. I got one of those right here. I banged it this morning when I was hitting on some shellfish. Now that's a swelled hand. Well, what did you say? Oh, what? A smelly pan? I got one of those right here. I cooked some shellfish in it last week. <laughs> That's a smelly pan. So let me in the club. A shell gland. All mollusks have them. Oh, yeah. I almost forgot. I got a shell gland right here inside my mantle. We mollusks use this thing to secrete a hard shell. Watch this, and I'll show you how we do it. Pretty cool, huh? Eventually, this stuff hardens into a shell. So, I got my mantle and my shell gland, and I'm ready to boogie, oogie, oogie. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. Club Mollusk is very exclusive. You're also going to need a radula to get in here. Like I said, man, no respect. No respect at all. But if it's a spatula you want, a spatula you'll get. Nobody keeps me out of Club Mollusk. You'll never get in Club Mollusk with that. What? You didn't say spatula. Of course I know what you're talking about. I'll be right back. Now that's more like it, huh? This is a pretty radical radula. A lot of the coolest mollusks I know use these things to scrape the plants and animals that we eat. Now let me in the club, you big slug. No problem, sir. You've got a mantle, a shell gland, and a radula. Have a good time. Well, it's about time. I finally got inside Club Mollusk with about 100,000 of my closest friends, including Olivia the Octopus and Sammy the Squid, Kathy Clam, Scotty the Snail, and Susie Scallop. Well, I hope this episode doesn't leave you shell-shocked, but it's about time for me to clam up and squidoo. So I guess I'll just say bye-bye, Valve. I'm Dr. How We Do It, and that's how we do it. Thanks, Howie. We're back now with David Temple, ready to take your live call-in questions. And I believe that our first call today is from Rosenberg, Texas. Zachary, do you have a question for David and I? Hello? Are you there, Zachary? Zach? Looks like we may have lost Zach. In the meantime, I think what Zach may have been wondering was, uh, do squid attack people? Generally, no. They're very shy and very reclusive, and like we saw on that footage there, uh, they don't come around people very much. There have been cases of scientists, though, who have been studying squid, not the ones that we saw in the picture there, but actually some that are maybe two to three feet uh, large, and squid are very naturally curious. They're very intelligent and they're very curious, and these animals have come up and they've grabbed the diver and started trying to swim off with them, but the diver's been very 
easily uh, to shake himself free and push him away. But they came up and grabbed him. These were actually cuttlefish, came up and grabbed him. And they took him down, oh, 20, 30 feet or so before he pushed him away. Well, that's kind of scary. Him go. Yeah, it is. But they were basically, from their perspective, he was food. And if he wasn't uh, smart enough to uh, fight him off, then they were going to take a meal if they could. But he was just the diver with the marine biologist was basically just seeing what they would do. OK, we have another caller on the line now. Jeanette from Montana. Good morning, Jeanette. Do you have a question for us? <laughs> Hello? Uh, could Hi. You clone, could you clone uh, uh, seashell? What was the question? Could you repeat that one more time, please? Could you clone seashell? Can you kill a seashell? Can you kill a seashell? No, you can't kill a seashell because this, the seashell is just the animal's home. You can, unfortunately, kill mollusks, and there's uh, any number of ways to do that. In Houston, the common garden snail is considered a pest, and some people will actually put out poison and things like that. And I guess uh, taking them out of their natural environment, the water would certainly kill them. We could always step on them if you were so inclined. And we know that crabs often inhabit, like hermit crabs, oh, will yeah. inhabit the shells of mollusks. Do they actually kill the mollusks to get into those homes? or? No, usually not. They're opportunists. So they'll just see an empty shell on the floor. And like you might see an empty shell at the beach. They'll say, that's pretty neat. I'd like to have that. So they'll move right in. And we talked earlier that there are some snails and whatnot that are actually carnivores. So they may be eating each other. Absolutely. They, you do have uh, uh, mollusks that do that. The, the Texas state shell, the lightning whelk that we talked about, is carnivorous. So it will go after clams and basically use the edge of its shell and the strength of its foot to pry open the clams and then eat them that way. Okay, thanks, Jeanette. We have another caller from Montana. Johnson, do you have a question for us? Um, what kind of um, animal is that, like, animal that lives in the um, shells? What kind of what just, what kind What of? kind of animals live in the shells, or what are the animals? The animals that live in there the animals that live in there are called mollusks. They're soft-bodied animals. What that means is you, I'm, a, I'm fairly certain, almost 100% have a skeleton. <laughs> so you have an internal framework, bones that run through your body. Uh, these animals don't. They have no skeleton at all. And so they're basically just soft-bodied uh, soft animals that live in a hard shell. But they have no external skeleton whatsoever. So really, the shells are, are mostly for skeleton. protection. That's right. The shells are for protection. Okay, thanks so much for calling in. We have another caller on the line now. Martin for Vermont. Oh. Hi, what's your question? Hi. Um, um, well, um, is it true that snails ha are growing boys at the same time? The snails are what? Could you repeat that one more time? I'm sorry. It looks like we lost the caller. Um, I'm not sure what his question was. I I'm, I'm, uh, couldn't understand it either. Are they unisex? Are they unisex? Do shells, oh. are they male and female oh. mollusks? Great question. Yeah, excellent question. Some are and some aren't. So some, some uh, mollusks can reproduce just by themselves. OK, we've just been joined by Pat Conway, the Director of Education here at the museum, who is here with us on the show to talk about National Science and Technology Week. Welcome, Pat. Well, thank you, Kate. I'd like to tell you about National Science and Technology Week by showing you our poster. This poster is provided by our National Science Foundation, and it talks about the theme for 1997, which is wires, webs, and waves. And what this really is showing us in this poster is that this cone-headed Katie did makes a chirp in the garden. The garden noise goes over the telephone that is being used by the And it travels the all the way up. I'm sorry, Pat. Looks um, like we're running out of time. Just real quickly, tell our viewers when the week is happening so they can come to the museum you, and participate. The week is happening April 20th through 26th, and there's lots of activities you activities can do. Activities going on. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next Tuesday. Have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye. The preceding was a presentation of HEB Satellite in the Classroom with additional support from Nestle, working together to support education. Thank you.